So how do we know God is indescribable? And he is indescribable. This is not the indescribable tour because Chris has a song named indescribable. This is the indescribable tour because the song is about a God who truly is indescribable. There are hardly enough words. What, what is up with you people, by the way? You're the shouters back there in the Dancing Generation song. I like you people. Yeah, whoever you are back there, that's awesome. Yeah. But we are here tonight to worship. This is an amazing thought. A God who is indescribable. You say, well, how do you know that? All you have to do is walk outside on a dark night and look up into the sky and you will know when you look up that this God we're worshiping tonight is beyond our wildest dreams. The scripture says, I love the way the psalmist wrote this. He said, the heavens are telling the glory of God. In other words, they're not just up there, twinkle, twinkle, little star. They're on display and they are shouting back down to all of us who look their way saying, God is amazing. He is indescribable, incredible, bigger than you've ever dreamed of. He's greater than your biggest prayer, the biggest step of faith you've ever taken. This God is amazing. All you have to do is look up. And the scripture says, the heavens are telling the glory of God. The skies declare the work of his hands. Day after day, the psalmist wrote, they pour forth speech. And night after night, they tell us what they know. And they're telling us tonight, don't count him out and don't sell him short because God is huge. He is ginormous. He is greater than every thought we've ever had of him. And they're like a billboard who tells us that every single day. The scripture is so simple. I love it. I love science too. But the scripture says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I love that. Some people think it was the Big Bang. I'm okay with that too. I think when God created the heavens and the earth, it was a fairly large bang. I think there was quite an event going on when God created the heavens and the earth. And that's not, that's not, um, that's no knock on science because I think we're all on the same path here to discover this mystery of creation. A few verses later it says, and God said, let there be light and there was light. Of course there was. If that's what God asked for, that's what God got. And when he wanted light, he got light. And the universe came into existence. And it's massive. We don't even know how big it is. The, we, we always call it the known universe. In other words, translation, we haven't built a big enough telescope yet to see exactly what is out there that God has created. But every time we build a bigger telescope, we're wowed once again that it's bigger than we thought. There's more amazing stuff out there that we've never seen. And God's just laughing all over again going, yeah, congratulations. Is that all you got? All right. Well, go back and build a bigger one. And when you come back, I'll show you something else that you haven't seen yet. He must be up there going, come on, work on it faster, build it faster. I got stuff up here that will blow your mind. <laughs> Scientists are stumped. One of their dilemmas is they think there must be more habited planets in the universe. And one of the arguments, I think it's a great argument. The argument is if if the universe is just simply a habitation for you and me, it's way oversized, to which I go right on to that. I think it might be a little too big if it's just a home for you and for me. But what if the primary purpose of the universe is not to be a home for you and me, but what if its primary purpose is to show off the splendor and the majesty and the greatness and the glory of the God who created it all, then the universe is not too big at all. The universe is just about the right size after all. When light came out of the mouth of God, I hear people say things all the time that they don't think about. They're like, I would like to have been there when God created the world. Oh, no, you wouldn't have wanted to be there when God created the world. You would not have wanted to be there the day he said, let there be light. Because when he opened his mouth, light came flying out of the mouth of God, traveling 186,000 miles a second. That's the speed of light, in case you weren't paying attention back in middle school. Light travels 186,000 miles a second. You're like, oh, my goodness, that's faster than we came up to Hardy Toll road to get here tonight. I mean, that's, that's moving on. Absolutely. It's so fast that a beam of light could circle the earth seven times every second. That's flying. And it came out of the mouth of God going that speed. You wouldn't want to be standing there in that moment when he opened his mouth and light came screaming out of his mouth, a blazing glory like nothing we have ever seen or comprehended going faster than we've ever imagined. And when he did, the universe just lit up. The scripture says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. 
the starry host by the breath of his mouth. We live in a little subdivision in the universe called the Milky Way Galaxy. In case you didn't know, that's where you live. Some of you are thinking you live in Shady Grove. No, you, you're living in the Milky Way Galaxy. That's your subdivision in the universe, a very big universe that we have to use something called a light year to get around in. You say, well, what's a light year? Well, that's how fast light travels in one year. And we know it's flying 186,000 miles a second. So if light goes 186,000 miles a second for a whole year, it goes 5.88 trillion miles in a year. And that's the measurement or one of the main measurements we use to get around in the universe that God has created. That's how big it is. The foot, not gonna help you in God's universe. The yard, of no value to you whatsoever in God's universe. The mile, insignificant. The kilometer, Matt, uh, not gonna help you uh, getting around in God's universe. We have to use a ruler that is 5.88 trillion miles long to measure things in God's universe. And our home subdivision, the Milky Way galaxy, just came into being. It, cons it's con it consists of billions of stars, just our subdivision, the Milky Way galaxy. Not hundreds, not millions, not hundreds of millions, billions of stars in our home subdivision, the Milky Way galaxy. And scientists say that there are hundreds of billions of other subdivisions and galaxies in the known universe. This shot is where we live. It's a little snapshot of the Milky Way galaxy. If you zoom into this star-forming region, you see something pretty amazing. This particular shot is a close-up of a star-forming region in our subdivision taken by a friend of ours named Dr. David Block, who's an astronomer down at Witts University in Johannesburg, South Africa. And we were down there a few months ago, and he was telling us that if we were to count the billions of stars in the Milky Way galaxy, one star per second, so if we just started with any one of these, I don't know which one you want to pick. Um, let's just start with this one right here. And we, because I can reach it. And we start one, two, three, four, five. That looks like one, but I'm close enough to see it's two that are close together. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. Let's go back over here. 12. You're like, oh, please don't count them all. If we counted all the stars in our subdivision, one per second, it would take 2,500 years just to count the stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And God says about himself, you, you, you wanna know how the universe is telling us that God is big? Through the prophet Isaiah, he says, to whom will you compare me? And who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift your eyes to the heavens. Who created all of these. And then he answers for himself. The one who leads forth the starry host one by one and calls them each by name because of his mighty strength and great power, not one of them is missing. We've got to right size him tonight. He is not our size he does not have a brain like ours. He does not think like we think. He is working on a canvas bigger than we have ever dreamed of or imagined. And he is bigger than anything we've ever seen in our lifetime. He is huge. And the heavens are telling us that, but they're telling us something else tonight. Not only are they telling us God is huge, they're telling us that you and me, that we are really, 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 really small. Okay, what was that? God got amen and applause for being huge. We got nervous laughter for us being really, really small. <laughs> that means a lot more when it comes right after the phrase. <laughs> but I'll give partial credit for that. If you wanna get a glimpse of it, here's a composite shot of our subdivision. The Milky Way galaxy is taken by com combining hundreds of thousands of photographs. Uh, obviously, we haven't managed to get outside of the Milky Way galaxy to take a picture of it, but um, NASA folks are pretty sure that's what it looks like. It has a, a barred nucleus. It's a barred spiral galaxy. And you're like, wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's 100,000 light years across. So if you want to go visit your neighbors on the other side of the subdivision, you just have to go 186,000 miles a second for 100,000 years, and boom, you're at their house. Um, <laughs> 
in our little neighborhood home called the Milky Way Galaxy. You say, well, where are we? I'm, I'm looking for us on there. You know, we, we got to be right in the center, obviously. I'm sure we're right in that, right there in that middle. No, we, believe it or not, we're not even in the center of our own subdivision, okay? So affirming again tonight, it's not about you and it's not about me. We don't even live in the center of our own subdivision and you don't want to live in the center of the subdivision because it's scary in the center of the subdivision. We, you say, well, where do we live? Well, we live way out between a couple of the spiral arms. You don't want to live in there either because that's dangerous territory inside the bands. We live in that little clear zone between a couple of the bands, about two-thirds of the way out. We're living somewhere about there. And you're, you're like, well, I don't, I don't see me. No. Because we couldn't put a mark on the diagram that you could see that would be the right relative size to our solar system. You know, that's our little cul-de-sac in the subdivision that we couldn't even put our solar system on here in relative size to the Milky Way galaxy for you to see. It's that small inside the Milky Way galaxy. Scientists say our solar system is the size of a quarter and the Milky Way galaxy is the size of the North American continent. So our whole solar system is a quarter and the size of an area as big as the North American continent. We're not that consequential in our own subdivision called the Milky Way galaxy. And somewhere in there is a star, one of these billions of stars. It's not the biggest, the baddest, the brightest. It's just one of the stars of the billions of stars we call it the sun and around it tonight are orbiting these balls, one of which is called earth. It's our home. That's you and me. This particular image came from Apollo 17. There was a day for those of you who are my age and older, you remember when we were, uh, smart enough to get off the planet for the first time. <laughs> Let's hear it for old people. <laughs> Some of you young people are like, oh yeah, that's the earth. I've seen that. But the first time we saw it, it was like, oh wow. And we look back at ourselves. It was stunning. And what you see, particularly in this image, you you see Africa, if you know your geography well. You see the very tip of Southern Africa down about middle of the earth with a wisp of cloud coming over the Cape of Good Hope. You see the Sahara Desert and barren across the top left, Sinai Peninsula to the top right and just the tip edge there, you see the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea just up at the very top left edge. But what's amazing about the, the picture is that you don't see any countries or any cities or any people. You don't see the great need that is there. You don't see the poverty and the strife and the pain. You don't see the glory and the glamor. You don't see anybody's yard or anybody's car. And as you step back, you just begin to get this feeling that maybe we're not so big after all. I mean, we know the one who made this world must be enormous. But all of a sudden we get this feeling that maybe the fall tricked us and maybe we're not quite as important as we thought we were. Or maybe our lives aren't quite as grand as we made them out to be. I love this quote, it's from Neil Armstrong, the first man who walked on the moon. He grabs this thought when he says, I remember on the way home on Apollo 11, it suddenly struck me that tiny pea, pretty and blue, was the earth. I put my thumb up and shut one eye and my thumb blotted out planet earth. Listen to his conclusion. He said, but I didn't feel like a giant. I felt very, very small. I think the psalmist got it right when he said, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? 
1977, we launched a spacecraft called Voyager on a one-way mission to take images of the planets and our own solar system. And 13 years later, Valentine's Day, 1990, scientists from the JPL sent a message to Voyager and said, before you go any further, turn around and take one last panoramic snapshot of all the planets you visited. By now, Voyager is 3.7 billion miles away from the earth. It's traveling 40,000 miles an hour away from the sun. And it turns around and takes a series of photographs. Obviously you can't get one wide angle shot of Uranus and Neptune and Saturn and the planets that it's visited. So it takes a succession of 60 images. And it starts to send the images back to earth. Each image, 640,000 pixels in every one of the 60 images. You say, what's a pixel? It's that little tiny dot that makes up a photograph. And 3.7 billion miles away, the pixels are taking five and a half hours each to make it back to the earth. 60 images, 640,000 pixels in each image, five and a half hours for each pixel to make it back to the earth. And you think you have dial up problems at the house, okay? That is a massive dial-up problem. And it takes months for the image to come back. And when it does, it absolutely stuns astronomy. Very famous picture, floored me the first time I saw it. The image that came to us, once it was put in a composite form from 3.7 billion miles away, famous image called the pale blue dot. You're like, excuse me. Did, did I miss something? <laughs> we waited several months to get that back. I, those are the ones I throw away at the Walmart. You know, you go through at the back and you're like, oh no, I had my thumb over the lens on that one. No good, no good. Can I get my money back on these? No. You say, well, what are the green and the pink bands in the image? They're, they're rays of sunlight reflecting off Voyager because sun, even though nearly 4 billion miles away, was in view. And it just so happened that suspended in one of the beams of sunlight was a tiny little speck. Do you see it? Yeah, for you guys in the cheap seats, I'll blow it up just a tad for you. It's, it's, it's there. If you're still not with me, it's right there. I don't want anyone to miss it. And we can just go back to the, the big shot for a second. It's a picture of Earth from 3.7 billion miles away. And it just so happened to be caught in a ray of light. And one famous astronomer of the day said of it, just remarking that everyone who's ever lived their lives lived them out on that tiny pale blue dot that he called a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. I don't know about you, when I first saw it, a shrinking feeling came over me. And I knew in that moment that my life was a tiny little blip on the radar of history, a vapor, infinitesimal little life. You say, well, Louis, you're, you're making me feel small. <laughs> no, I'm not trying to make you feel small. I'm trying to help you see that you are small. but it's significant insignificance. Because as tiny as we are, we are known and prized by majesty who sent for us and loves us and knows us even though we are teeny tiny little bitty people on a little bitty speck floating through the vast cosmos that he has made. Just like he could name every star as he called them into being and put them in their places. He could start in this building tonight all the way up in the top with you right there. And he could call you by your name and he could move to you and call you by your name and you by your name. And the great creator of all the heavens and the earth could move through this auditorium and call every single person in this building by name tonight. He knows us and is aware of us and loves us and has come to invite us into a relationship with him that will never ever end. 
It's amazing when you think about it. When you think about how big he is, that we know his name. I wanna take you on a quick journey outward if you're up for it. I think you guys are tonight. Um, Houston would be like kind of the home of the space program, by the way, um, at least one of the key centers. And so I wanna take you out a little bit. Um, we're gonna go 93 mi million miles out from that little pale blue dot to our near star, our sun, which is what we call it. We're not sure what God calls it. He named it, but we call it the sun. You know it. Um, it burns you up. You're around here, you get it. Um, by the way, nice day here in Houston. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got outside. You get 16 of those a year here in Houston, so I hope you loved every minute of it. You understand probably more than the other cities that we're gonna be going to about the sun. It's a raging ball of fire, people. It is not just up there, you know, nice and happy, smiley face coming up, you know, as we used to draw it as kids. It is 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface. It is raging intensity. It is like billions of nuclear bombs going off every second. So strong, it's sending light out at 186,000 miles a second. It only takes the beam of light eight minutes to cover the 93 million mile journey journey from the sun to your skin in Houston, Texas. And it came out of the mouth of God. We cannot think that he is some kind of mamby-pamby God, some kind of mealy little weak God. He is ferocious, this God we are worshiping tonight. He is intense in power and holiness and radiant splendor and might. And he opens his mouth and things like that just come out of his mouth. We got to remember that tonight. That's who we're worshiping. It's 100 times the diameter of Earth. In case you don't know how big that is, take a look. This gives you a little perspective on us. And that's why tonight when you go to sleep, you wanna thank God that we're 93 million miles away from the sun. This next image comes to us from the Swedish Solar Institute. They're doing close-up studies of the surface of the sun and that's what you get. It's raging fire. Scientists say it would take the gross national product of the United States of America for seven million years for your local power company to run the sun for one second. And it's just one of the billions of stars in our subdivision called the Milky Way, which is one subdivision among hundreds of billions of subdivisions in the known universe that God has made. He's big. Go out a little ways. Let's use that ruler we talked about, okay? The light year, you remember? 5.88 trillion miles. Let's use that and go out. We're just 93 million miles here. That's nothing. Let's take some strides. 440 light years out. We come to this beautiful constellation called Pleiades. I just put this one in because it's so beautiful. And because it's mentioned many times in scripture, in the Old Testament books, the prophets, and in Job, Job's having that conversation with God and God's trying to remind him that he's the one that's big and Job is the one that's small. And he says to Job, Job, can you hold the Pleiades in your hand? To which Job looks up and says, no. And God's like, well, there. One place in the scripture, it says that God measures the universe in the span of his hand the whole universe. <laughs> He's like, yeah, it's about right there. Let's go out a little further. There's so many amazing things. We're gonna go a thousand light years out to the Vela Pulsar. Check this out. This is absolutely stunning. Isn't that cool? Well, it's probably more than cool. It's um, hot, but it's interesting and amazing. You say, well, what's a pulsar? Um, I don't know. Um, I don't have a degree in astronomy, okay? Um, a star explodes into a supernova, can collapse back on itself into a magnetic intensity. Now, this is a highly magnetized neutron star. It's oscillating 11 times a second, the center of it. And it's, it's huge, by the way. I love it because it looks like double bow and arrow shooting an arrow out, but it's sending out this intense signal out. And not only is it beautiful to look at, thousand light years away from us, but we aimed a radio telescope at the Vela Pulsar. That's what we're using to see if there are other people out there trying to talk to us. And uh, we aimed it at the Vela Pulsar. And this is what we got back from the Vela Pulsar. This is what that thing sounds like right there. It just does that all day and all night. 
I, I don't know Morse code, but it could be tapping out. No, he's big. He's really, really big. He's a whole lot bigger than you think he is. He's really, really big. This God we worship, he's really, really, really big and a whole lot bigger than you think he is. Didn't want to miss out on the worship. Didn't want to miss out. All creation was glorifying God. And the Bella Paul Star said, all right, here we go. Now let's jump 8,000 light years out. This is the Hourglass Nebula. Yeah, that's, I think God just put that one up there for fun. It's a dying star emitting tons of gases that are cooling and creating this beautiful thing. The star that's dying is not the one you see to the left, but the one right in the center of the eyeball. I don't know about you, when I was growing up, the ultimate trump in my house was my mom saying, well, you better watch out and be careful because God is watching you. Well, it turns out she was right after all. God sees everything and knows everything. He can't see you with the hourglass nebula. He may see you with um, the helix nebula or with a stardust ring, there's a lot of options for him to see us. Check it out, isn't that amazing? <laughs> yeah, well, let's take a massive leap. We're 8,000 light years out now. We're gonna go 28 million light years. Can do the math on the way home. 28 million times 5.88 trillion. You're like, are you kidding me? No, you come to the Sombrero Galaxy, just one of the beauties of our universe. You say, oh, that's nice. It looks like a little Frisbee. No, 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 no. It's 50,000 light years wide. It's trillions of miles thick. It just happens to be sitting in space in such a way that we're just above the elliptic plane, almost looking dead on the edge of it, but just six degrees above it. And just up there in all of its splendor, most of you have never seen it before. You say, well, what's it doing up there? Just glorifying God, just showing off the greatness and the majesty of God, just hanging out in the universe that he made, reflecting back to him his glory tonight and how amazing he is. Since we're in Houston, I wanted just to say just a word of thanks. Um, this image and many of the ones we're seeing tonight have come to us from the Hubble Space Telescope, which I'm sure you've heard of. You're paying for it, by the way. I hope you've heard of it. Um, it's an amazing thing. Here's a shot of it in case you didn't know what you were paying for. You're like, that's it? That's what we get? Yeah, it's fascinating, this thing. Now, this particular photograph was taken in 1997, just after Service Mission 2. The Hubble hangs out uh, 353 miles above the earth. And so it's got a great jump on us getting out, outside of our atmosphere and gives us stunning images like uh, we've never seen before. And I was just gonna tell you quickly, Chris and I were at a camp this summer and I was trying some of these space stuff out on middle school and high school students because I figured if it worked for them, it might work for you guys tonight. And they were so cool. They were just like, wow, no way. You know, just like teenagers would be, I was loving it. But I got home and I got a package in the mail and it was a, a DVD of some Hubble images and video and a note. And I started reading the note and just freaked out in my office. I, I've never taken the note out in public, but I've brought it tonight. I'm gonna read it for you. Um, Sorry about that. Um, it, it, I'll, I'll just read it. I've, I don't care if you think this is cool. This is cool. I've never read this in public before. It's never been out among other people before. And I'll just give you the short version. It says, Dear Louie, thank you for your time at our camp. Um, um, the person's uh, uh, children or child were th was there. And it uh, comes down to the second paragraph. They said you have a passion for astronomy. You may like this collection of HST videos. I was on service mission too. That's what the point I started going, oh. So I too have a special connection to the telescope as it reveals the magnificence of God's creation. Um, in his service, Joe Tanner, and I'm like, Joe Tanner. So I just, I grab my, um, I grab my computer and I go to the NASA site and I type in Joe Tanner and come to find out he's like an astronaut. I'm like, I have a letter from an astronaut. I got a letter from an astronaut. <laughs> That's cool, that's cool. These guys pay a great price to let us see and know a lot of what we see and know. This next image is a shot of some guys uh, in space working on the telescope. I had to turn it sideways, so don't get confused. It kind of goes the other way, but screens are different. That's the bay of the space shuttle and the telescope is docked into it and these astronauts are updating and working on the Hubble Space Telescope. And Joe Tanner, my friend 
and letter writer is the one in the middle right there with his hands on the thing. Um, and he's here tonight. And I'd just like to say thank you to him for being a great friend. And I'd love for you guys to say thank you to him. That's cool. That's awesome. We're going to go out. We're 28 million light years out at the Sombrero Galaxy. We're going to go past it to the darling of astronomy, the Whirlpool Galaxy. It's 31 million light years away. And you can see why it's the darling of astronomy. It sits in space completely face on to the Earth. It's called a grand design galaxy, to which I say right on to that. Um, it's made up of hundreds of billions of stars. Some scientists say 300 to 500 billion stars. It's called a whirlpool because it looks like it could just suck you in. For a while, they thought it was sucking in this white blob over here to the right. You're like, what's that blob to the right? That's a whole nother galaxy. Thank you very much. That's NGC 5195 over there. And the whirlpool's NGC 5194. They thought that it was gonna suck it into the whirlpool, but no, they're, they're way, way, way far apart. They're never gonna touch each other. Rest well tonight. And after billions of years, they'll just pass each other in space. The pink areas, you say, it's so pretty with those little pink twinkles. No, those are ferocious star-forming incubators. And stars are being born in there even as we worship tonight. Scientists say every second in the universe, a new star is born. Stars as big as our sun and bigger. It's being put into place. And God's just naming them all and putting them where they are in His universe. But I want to take you way out. You guys seem like a group that's ready to go way out. I wanna take you so far out, I can't even tell you what we're about to see. I can't even set it up, I can't describe it. There are no words. We are going far, 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 far out. Yes, it is. I'll just let you see it. He made everything we've seen tonight. The scripture says that through Jesus, God made the world. In another place, Paul wrote, he created all things, things in heaven and things on the earth. And you say, well, what's the left turn? We're seeing all these Amazing things out in the universe and now the cross. Yes, the cross, the creator of it all. Coming to that pale blue dot. The maker of the whole wide universe hanging on a cross that he himself created. And you hear the words of Paul, words we've heard many, many times, but so in focus tonight, Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death even death on a cross. When you hear the writer of the Psalms speaking thousands of years before, and you know why, the Psalm writer said, the Lord is compassionate and gracious. That's who we're worshiping tonight. That's the God we've come here to celebrate tonight. A God who is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Praise God for that. We don't get from God what we deserve. We don't get what we have earned because of our rebellious hearts towards him. But listen to what we get. 
He says, for as high as the heavens are above the earth. And we don't even know how high that is. Our ruler won't go that far. We're not even sure what the upside is of the heavens that are above us. But the psalmist says, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. And in the next breath, he says, and as far as the east is from the west, that's how far he has removed our transgressions from us. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you've done. I don't know what your life looks like. I don't know what you're trailing behind you. I don't know what kind of shame, what kind of mess, what kind of failure that you're trailing behind you in your life. But I know this. I know that long before you made a mess out of your life, God the Father made a mess out of his life. And there is a shadow of Calvary over this building tonight. It is the shadow of the cross of Jesus Christ. And there is freedom here. There is forgiveness here and cleansing and newness and washing because Jesus Christ Christ in him. There is therefore now no condemnation. Guilt is over and shame has been done with at the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's what we call astronomical grace. I want to show you one last image before we respond to him together. You say, there are no more images, Louis. Thank you. It's the son of God crucified for my sins. There can be nothing else. Well, while I was in Durango with these students, I was just looking for something that I hadn't seen before. I was on the Hubble site searching Whirlpool images. Uh, you remember the darling of astronomy, the Whirlpool galaxy. And I just searched Whirlpool, a list of uh, names of images came up. One of them was called the X structure at the core of the Whirlpool galaxy. Got my attention. I thought, okay, I click on that link and a photograph comes up, an image comes up on my computer screen, almost knocks me off of my seat. I cannot believe it. I'm just staring at it with my mouth open. It's 31 million light years away. The Hubble Space Telescope, seeing what we cannot see, has looked into the dark black hole core of the Whirlpool Galaxy and sent us back a photograph. Here's what NASA sent us back from 31 million light years away, deep in the core of the Whirlpool Galaxy. We get this image coming back to us. Wow. It's the X structure in the core of the Whirlpool Galaxy. I'm not here to scientifically tell you it's a cross. You can make of it what you want to tonight. I'm just saying it reminds me of the Revelation writer who said, it's Jesus Christ, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. It's Jesus everywhere. It's grace everywhere you turn. It's mercy when you least expect to find it. It's God laughing in heaven when we finally got the Hubble aimed at the right place. And he goes, check this out. It's me. It's grace. It's mercy. It's kindness. It's forgiveness. Everywhere you look, it's God saying, I love you. <laughs> There's grace everywhere. Amen. And long before you decided what you were going to do with God, God decided what he was going to do with you. And that was to not give you what your sins deserved, but to give his son what your sins deserved. And to give you the gift of himself and an invitation to live forever in a big, big story that is all about him. There's grace and hope. I don't know, maybe you're here tonight looking up at a huge mountain. Maybe it's a mountain called depression or divorce 
or abandoned or loneliness. Maybe you have been wrongly accused and have been served a huge injustice. It could be cancer or bankruptcy or the darkness of death itself. But I say to you tonight, there is nothing that this world can throw at you that can shake you out of the hand of God who is holding the entire universe in his very palm tonight and holding you. And his grace is big enough and strong enough to hold on to you through it all and to bring you through it all and to bring you to the very end of it all, still loving him and rejoicing in his goodness, even in the darkness. And you can trust him tonight. Oh, we haven't seen everything we've wanted to see from God. I haven't in my life. But we've seen enough to trust him fully for the rest of our days. It's love so amazing and love so divine, it demands, deserves, should get back our soul and our life and our all. Thank you, Jesus Christ, Son of God, creator of all things, savior of the world. Thank you for astronomical grace for teeny tiny people like us to buy us back and rescue us into your arms for this day and for every day, forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen.